it's time for some more actually autistic TikToks. TikToks from actual real life. Is it real life or real life? Real whatever autistic people. Let's go. Oh, I wish she was on the uh, US Love on the Spectrum. As a little girl, she may know she's different, but not yet have the words to describe how or why. She may only have a few close friends, or she may choose to immerse herself within her interests for hours, collecting endless amounts of information. She might work hard to keep her composure at school and around friends and extended family, but when she finally returns to her sanctuary, she may melt down as a result of bottled up emotions accumulated throughout the day. The world around her can feel too loud, too bright, and too smelly. She often finds herself unable to accurately predict the intentions and actions of the people she's close to. Through careful observation of social interaction, she learns to mimic the mannerisms of others. She quickly connects this mimicry with social acceptance from her peers, despite not always being able to perform it reliably. In fact, her inconsistent brand of social niceties, small talk, and reciprocal conversation might be what you saw first if you knew what to look for. Her renditions of normalcy earn unspoken and mostly unconscious ratings by others, ranging anywhere from deserving of an Emmy Award to stiff and uncanny. Entering adolescence, she continues to perfect her craft and is more or less able to mask her social difficulties. Aside from the people closest to her, no one is fully aware of how she struggles to cope with small changes, keep her body still and quiet, and control her emotions. Moving into adulthood and out of the comfort of living with her mother, she finds that sometimes the demands of adult life exceed her current abilities. Adulthood has unearthed the gaps in her skill sets that weren't as pronounced or prohibitive in childhood. Eventually, she learns the word to describe this wasn't weird. The word for this is autism, and she finds the support she needs to continue to thrive. I can't speak. I was not prepared. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I don't have anything else to say other than that. It was great. I feel like that sums up my whole life story. I feel like she even looks a bit like, like me, like a the, like broad blonde straight across fringe from her. This is why it's so, in it's so insulting when people try and insinuate that people who can mask, who have the ability to mask are just fine and they don't need a diagnosis and like the kind of taking from people who have real problems by calling themselves autistic. Before an autism diagnosis, I just knew I had difficulties in my mental health and, and I was a bit different in the way that I operated and, and that that wasn't helpful having the name autism being able to read other people's stories knowing why I'm triggered why I react in certain ways why I do these things understanding a bit more about how my brain is wired it has been so helpful and it would have been so helpful when I was younger yes we may not need somebody to support us with basic everyday tasks all the time all the time not we, we may do sometimes but that doesn't mean that we don't deserve to be correctly diagnosed. It would have made the world of difference for me to have been able to access the diagnosis. Instead, I was turned away and told to go go and read some self-help books and the kind of the response was, you seem like an intelligent person and I think you'll be all right kind of thing. Anyway, I think that was an amazing video and I'm really thankful that people are putting these things online and it's just really nice to know that you're not alone, even though you felt like a baby for so many years and like nobody could understand you and like you were trapped behind glass and nobody knew what you were going through and I'm glad I don't have to think of myself as someone with some sort of vague mental illness that I have to keep secret and not tell anybody about and make sure I perform perfectly when I'm out and about no I'm an autistic person it was it's such a relief I need to recover <laughs> maybe the next one will be a bit a bit more upbeat it's what people think getting diagnosed as autistic is <laughs> it's from Cheryl again who we had in the the last TikToks video let's see what people think getting diagnosed as autistic is. Hey doc, so I watched this 30 second TikTok and I can confirm I'm autistic. Can I get diagnosed? Of course, let me just do you a referral. Okay, people get annoyed when I pause these too much so I'll try not to do it but that shirt is great. Let's move on. Hang on a minute, I can just diagnose you right here. It'll be way quicker. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> It will be way quicker than the way she's speaking. It's so good. What it actually is. Hey, Doc, so I've been doing years of research and I think maybe I'm autistic. Okay, but you're literally 27. Why does it matter? Well, autism affects people in adulthood too. Here's a list of autism criteria I relate to. I can see you've visited us a few times for mental health reasons. Are you sure you're not just anxious? 
I can refer you for CBT if you like. Well, funny you mention that. The anxiety and everything else could be because I'm autistic. Unlikely. <laughs> well, I'd just really like to be referred for an autism assessment. I relate to so much of the autism criteria and it would explain a lot. All right then. Do you know how I refer people for an autism assessment? No, isn't that your kind of area <laughs> of expertise? Isn't it yours? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Definitely in this country, it sounds like it's pretty damn hard everywhere else. I see a lot of people complaining about the system in America and elsewhere. Yeah, they have no idea. <laughs> what they're doing literally the national autistic society kind of basically tells you the information that you need to spoon feed to your gp about this oh no i'm just hoping it's going to change because there must be a lot of people seeking a diagnosis right now but uh, i don't know if you want some more information about that i went through a lot of the guidance that was on the national autistic society in this video that i did that was like am i really autistic like what do you think you should do next if you think you might be autistic anybody who has any sort of chronic health condition particularly and something that's maybe a little bit unusual something that isn't a UTI you know you probably know that you have to do a lot of poking and prodding and phone calls and emails and blah, blah, blah. and all of that is really hard when you're autistic as well it shouldn't be the way that it's set up you know anyway I've been looking at it here and it says for your first appointment it's at least a three year wait is that okay is that okay? Oh my gosh. I feel like sometimes it feels like they say things with glee. I don't think they do really, but that's how it feels. They're like, okay, fine, I'll do it for you, but it's gonna be three years. As if they expect you to turn around and go, oh yeah, I was just kidding anyway about being autistic. It's fine, don't worry about it. Like, huh, yeah, you, you got me. Damn it, I like responding as I go through because I forget what people have said. <laughs> and I forget what I wanted to say. Now I'm gonna have to watch it again, which is not too bad because it's good, but you know. Okay, but you're literally 27. Why does it matter? Well, autism affects people in adulthood too. Yeah, as I was saying on the last video, of course it matters. It doesn't matter if you're 27, I'm 27. Does it matter how old you are? You still are autistic. It's not something that you grow out of. You can learn coping mechanisms. Some of them that you just do, you know, intuitively as a survival thing, whatever, are not great, you know? Maybe getting the diagnosis can help you to unlearn some of those unhelpful coping mechanisms and ways that you've, you know, dragged yourself through life. Might be nice the problem in this country as well i don't know what it's like where you are it'd be interesting to know but we don't usually or at least in any of the practices that i've been joined at it's very rare that i will see the same person twice so each time i'm introducing myself to somebody who has never met me before and i think that it would be useful i mean i'm sure you still probably might come across barriers with a, like you know a gp who's been with you for a, for a longer amount of time they might be more likely because they've seen them masking you they might be more likely to turn around and go oh I, I don't think you are i think you can communicate fine you can look at me in the eye it's all okay it just would be nice if, we, if you had someone who knew you a medical professional who knew you and then you could be like oh you know at the time when i came in for this and this this thing happened to me when i was a teenager do you remember that yeah that that could have actually been to do with this and they would know you as a person and they would know you're not in there every week trying to diagnose yourself with a different ailment that you found on Line, you know and instead I think they just see this kind of collective general patient <laughs> if only a diagnosis was that easy and if only the wait lists weren't that long because a lot of places will limit the amount of accommodations you can get until you have an official diagnosis and I just think like what are people supposed to do particularly around like important parts of your life like when you're doing your GCSEs and A-levels and you're at university that you you need help you need support and sometimes you need proof in order to access it and yeah I mean so you may be able to still access it with proof that you are pursuing a diagnosis but it's just it's frustrating like we've already had to wait most of our lives damn it <laughs> now you're telling us we have to wait longer ah i did say it in the video about so you think you're autistic like now what should you do sort of thing but if a gp says you cannot be autistic because you can make eye contact the actual dsm-5 the criteria for diagnosing autism says abnormalities in eye contact and that's one example of one way you might appear different socially and abnormalities could mean that you have pretty strong eye contact maybe it's a bit too much you know or consistent abnormality does not mean inability so i would maybe you know bring that up to them if they, they try and say that and definitely go and see someone else and get a second opinion if they refuse, for sure. My favourite question on the autism diagnosis form is, would you rather go to the theatre or a museum? Because I get overstimulated at a theatre and understimulated at a museum. So, neither. <laughs> I just think it's the most stupid question 
ever. I suppose they're thinking the autistic answer is the museum because they like facts and filing away little facts in their little filing cabinet brain. But there are so many autistic actors. We get quite good at policing the way our face moves and the words that come out of our mouths and our tone and stuff like that. We can be pretty good at acting. I imagine there are a lot of autistic people who have a special interest in theatre. Chloe Hayden, come on. Personally, I would say museum. I do like a good museum. I always have liked a good museum, but I don't hate going to the theatre. I don't find it an unpleasant experience. I'm not really a fan of like musicals, don't shoot me. But I like dance, I love dance. I love watching like, you know, ballets and stuff like that. I, I don't personally find that overstimulating as, as a rule. I'm sure there are situations where it could be, but generally I would find that quite an enjoyable experience. Someone was like, you know, I've got some tickets, we'll go to the theater. I wouldn't be like, you know, running away screaming. It's just so weird. And it's, this is kind of like why I made that video that's like, what is special interest or not what you think? Because it's like, we can be interested in anything. But have you been around creative people? Like a lot of my friends have been creative people. We're all so weird. <laughs> Why do you think we're so weird? You know, there's a lot of neurodivergence flying around. It's a stupid question and it's kind of insulting. I actually saw this tweet, autism assessment question. Would you rather go to a theater or museum? Me, well, I could go to, mu <laughs> go to the museum in the day and then head to the theater for an evening performance. <laughs> Yes, it is possible to like both, actually. And you could even fit them in to the same day. You could pick any two like arbitrary things that people might like to do recreationally. You will find a bunch of autistic people who enjoy either one of them. What is wrong with the theater? Why is the theater not inherently something an autistic person would enjoy? Because of noise levels? Is that what we're thinking? Like a museum would be quieter, but like museums can be kind of like echoey. They, they can be very busy. I've been to the Natural History Museum in London when it's been like unbearable. <laughs> there have been so many people there. I, I don't get it. Like a theater is something you can do. You can do it on your own. You, you just sat focused on watching something. I've just found this post on the Wired Differently blog and it says, I was asked this question in 2019 as part of an assessment to see if I would receive an official autism diagnosis. The belief is that autistic people prefer museums because they're quieter than theaters. <gasps> The reality is that museums can be very noisy, especially on school holidays. Mmm, yep. And I once did a stand-up gig at a theatre in Guildford where the audience were completely silent. I do like museums, but not because they're quiet. If all I cared about was quiet, then I'd stay home in my quiet house. I do spend a lot of time at home in my quiet house with my headphones on to make it quieter. Cause yeah, I suppose with a young child, it's not always that quiet, let's be real. It's a silly question. Everyone knows it's a silly question, but it's still asked because we want some sort of measure so we can decide who gets to be autistic and who doesn't. Cause we wanna maintain this very important stereotype. There's lots which I believe needs to change about how we diagnose autism. Last year I met someone who, because they met two out of the three main diagnostic criteria, was told they were two thirds autistic I wondered if they were autistic up to their armpits or if the two thirds autisticness was evenly distributed around their whole body. Paige Leal, let's go. They're very, you know, greatly and heavily. Uh, I have not said out loud uh, to any more people than I should. I need to tell you guys my, my, my theory. I am convinced that every single dancer, every single human person who has the need to dance has autism ADHD or both. I'm a bother over here uh, and I am a dance teacher. And there's like 60 kids at the studio and I teach every single one of them and yup. No other type of human has the need to constantly move their body to get that vestibular input. I have three year olds that are just doing this the whole class. Like it's also clear in so many other ways like how they communicate with each other. And each kid is so different but they so have autism or ADHD or both. Dancers, parents of dancers, what do you think? I think I'm right. <laughs> oh, I really like Paige. I think I can see what she means. I have one of my, I think it's like the second video I ever posted on this channel where I talk about, I was trying to say spoke and talk. I talk about sensory traits of autism. In that one, I actually had dance as a separate sign that you could be autistic, enjoying dance, particularly for autistic women, which was kind of what I was aiming the video at, autistic women and AFAB individuals, but it kind of applies to anyone. Like I'm sure a lot of autistic boys would probably love to dance as well. There are probably many who do, and there will probably be more if it was more socially acceptable for boys to join dance classes. Um, I know some do, but usually it will be majority females in them. My job 
somewhat revolves around <laughs> around dance. I loved ballet when I was younger. I said in that video, I feel like ballet is made for autism. You're dancing on your toes, you're spinning around, it's quite routine and like you know you have to be quite polished and wear your nice uniform it's quite individual unless you're performing and you know what to expect and the most lessons are structured very similarly i don't know it just feels very very autism friendly so i can see that i'm sure there are lots of professional dancers you know it's like socially acceptable stimming you get to do it all day however i feel like if every single person at dance classes was autistic or ADHD, I would have had a lot more friends <laughs> when I went to ballet. I was there for years. I went to, to ballet from about the age of four until I was around 14. And I probably had about four friends the whole time I was doing it that would kind of come come and go, like they would leave and stuff. There's a chance I could have been picking up the other neurodivergent people in the class for sure. I'm sure there were other neurodivergent people in the class, but I felt pretty much just as ostracized there at those dance classes as I did at school everyone was in a big group and I didn't know how to integrate and how to be friends with them and there were many times where it was kind of like awkwardly silent in the changing room while I was with somebody else and things like that I mean that doesn't necessarily mean the other people weren't neurodivergent but I do tend to get on well with neurodivergent people obviously there's a lot of people who are neurotypical who I get on with well as, as well a lot of people yeah just get on great with everyone that's why I've got an autism diagnosis no I'm joking yeah I think there's too many people do dance I think it's too much of a common thing that your parents may even push you into because they want to see you in like cutesy leotards I feel like there's just too many people who end up doing it for it to be everyone I'm not sure if she was being hyperbolic or if she means everyone, but a lot of the people who are super into dance and who become professional dancers, I'd be interested in some studies to see how many people, I've, I've definitely heard things from dancers about this feeling like this need to like become the music, become one with the music. And that to me sounds stimmy. For my work, I see quite a lot of dance shows and I've definitely, I can notice autistic children for sure on stage. I definitely see like ear defenders and stuff a lot more and uh, it's really nice to see and it's nice to see them up there enjoying themselves and they're in a theatre and they're up there having a good time. See? See? This is diagnosing women with BPD instead of autism. Okay, let's see. Oh my god. Oh, she's called Unmasking with Chloe. I like her tattoos. They're so cool. That's so funny. I love that. Borderline personality disorder or sometimes called emotionally unstable personality disorder. Autistic women in particular often misdiagnosed with BPD. I don't know what the stats are on that. I'd be interested to look into that and maybe do a video talking about that. When I look at the traits, I can certainly see how it would happen. Yeah, I think a lot of people say they have both BPD and autism. If you find DBT helpful in the therapies for BPD, I'd love to see if there's research, whether they're helpful at all to autistic people. The group therapy, so that immediately makes me think, I don't know, I don't know. If you identify with both, then that, that's cool, but I think obviously a misdiagnosis is never helpful and is going to block you off from understanding yourself, understanding how your brain works, understanding your triggers, understanding why you are the way you are. And it's a pretty stigmatizing diagnosis to have emotionally unstable personality disorder there on your record. Obviously autism can also be stigmatizing as well, but like I've said before, if you're going to stigmatize us, stigmatize us for the right thing. And it's obviously wrong that BPD is stigmatized. I don't think it should be for anybody. Okay, she's got another one where um, she's crying and it looks like it's during a meltdown. So just trigger warning if you don't want to see that, then just skip over to the next chapter of the video because I don't know what it's going to be like. <laughs> if your partner or child or friend or whatever has a meltdown and they clearly distress and they say, stop speaking to me, please don't continue to speak to them. <laughs> Oh, I feel like we're we'll crying again. No, this is not going to be <laughs> the crying video. It's really hard for me to see other people in that state because you can re relate to it and you can empathize a bit too much, I think, with how they must be feeling. I think it's, it's probably good. I think it's a good thing that videos like that are online if they're shared consensually by the person who experienced them and not parents filming their children having meltdowns. I've seen some of that recently on Facebook and that just absolutely horrendous. I don't know why anybody would want to do that to their child and I feel like anyone who does that should be investigated because like 
what what are you doing that you're not recording so disrespectful and so horrible why would you want to do that to someone who you're supposed to love and protect i don't i don't understand it at all but people themselves sharing it like olivia hops also has a video on her channel which i've linked to a few times where she films herself going through a meltdown it's helpful when you're first trying to figure out whether you could be autistic to see oh yeah yeah, that's what it looks like that's interesting it's interesting to see what it looks like from the outside you've only experienced it from the inside and you're like yeah yeah that's it and obviously i know it's hard for other people to understand who don't go through it and relate to and sympathize and they may not always have the best methods hopefully as time goes on there'll be more resources for like people supporting autistic people and, and how to help them and that could be an interesting video topic that i could do it, it can be really tricky for other people to relate and to understand how to, to best help you in that situation i think listen ask people what they need not react like somebody is doing it on purpose to see it as a panic attack to see it as something that they can't help it's like like epilepsy like an epileptic fit or something it's, it's not something that someone's doing on purpose it, it, it kind of feels like people don't want when they're supporting autistic people sometimes they don't want them to feel like they can get away with it like they've got to kind of punish the person who's going through the meltdown because oh no we can't we can't let you particularly if you're newly diagnosed like oh no 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 we can't let you get away with this we can't let you think that this is okay behavior and use this as an excuse nobody wants to have a meltdown they are awful they're so draining they make you feel terrible for days Everybody, every autistic person would avoid that state if they could. They don't want to be doing that. Obviously, it can have real consequences sometimes on the people around you and other people around you are entitled to have emotions and feelings about it. But at the same time, if you're supporting an autistic person, getting angry back or like doing the opposite of what they're saying will, will help them. If they're begging you to, to, to like not speak in a certain way or to not do a certain thing, if you listen to them, they're going to be able to calm down and it's going to help to de-escalate the situation a lot faster, which is going to be better for everybody involved in the situation. I, I understand like I've been on the outside trying to support somebody and when you're not in that state, it can be really, really hard to empathize with that state. You can try and work together and get on the same page. The problem is that everybody's flawed and like neurotypical people can also have irrational responses to things. But I think, yeah, if, if someone can help you to manage that, it it can be really helpful. <laughs> Who would have thought it? It's not like if you, you're too nice to an autistic person going through a meltdown, they're just gonna wanna do it all the time. Like we, we, do, we don't wanna do it. If I could never be in that state again, oh my God, that would be such a relief, you know? Lucky now that at this age and the way I've set up my life, it's quite infrequent for me, but it's still obviously, it feels like it's, it's inevitable that it is always gonna happen at some point. And that is kind of devastating to be honest. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope she's okay. And I'm, I'm thankful that, that that is there because I think it'd be helpful to people. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you felt like that. Does anybody else with ADHD and autism find themselves hyper fixating on special interests now and again, but to the point where it's really stressful and you kind of wish you weren't hyper fixating on it? Because like one of my special interests is squishmallows and collecting squishmallows. And sometimes when they bring out new squishmallows I start really hyper fixating on them and like desperately trying to find them and it's really stressful like I proper wear myself down and if I can't get them like my life is over I could just watch that again and again because her accent is so great so yeah she's she, we say it's like Scouse accent she's from Liverpool if you're, you're from abroad and you don't know and people from Liverpool in general I don't want to generalize about you know a whole group of people but they're so nice they're so lovely so I have very like positive connotations with that accent it's very nice to listen to I completely completely relate to this it's like your special interests are supposed to be your safe place and sometimes they're just not your safe place I think with the squishmallows thing it's a control thing a like feeling of like oh, I need to have all of them and I need to get them now and what if I can't find them and they need to all be with me so that I can feel okay and it makes life feel kind of chaotic like uh, that's that's how I would feel anyway and that's how I relate to that yeah many times where my interests have been kind of obsessive have maybe caused more upset in my life and, and they started off as something that was bringing me joy sometimes that can be because maybe other things are going on in your life so you kind of like start trying to control your life through your interest because you feel out of control in other areas of your life. I don't know if that makes any sense. I remember getting very obsessive about this play that I did with my friends called African Footprint. We were putting on this performance based on a musical that I'd seen in South Africa, which was really amazing. It just became like, we had to get every single little thing perfectly right. And if we didn't, it caused me so much stress and so much upset and it felt so heavy and pressured. And it's like, but it was supposed to be fun. It was supposed to be a break from your normal life with school and all the things that you didn't like doing like ah 
why does it why did it have to become like that but at the time I was very upset because my closest friend my very special friend from ballet actually was moving away to another country and she was performing in it with me and it became like kind of a way I think of coping with the upset that, that was happening and I was going to lose that person and uh, yeah so sometimes it can be because of that and sometimes it's just because that's the way our brain works and we likes a bit of control <laughs> last one last one Over the eyes. <laughs> I love that. That's how it feels sometimes when you put your headphones on, you're like all disgruntled and you're like, oh, oh let me disappear into the void. <laughs> you just wish they could be everywhere. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. That sums up that feeling. <sighs> when you've been enduring all the noise, all the senses, all day you just need a bit of calm what would we do without a good old pair of headphones i never understood why everyone loved the little earbuds so much i've always been like a big big chunky headphone sort of person and now i understand why my husband always thought it was a bit weird i think and now it's like hmm, i guess i guess we know why if you enjoyed this one you might enjoy my last actually autistic tiktok reaction there's a lot of food stuff in that one it's, it's proved to be quite controversial a lot of discussion about how people from different parts of the world make their sandwiches and whether they butter their sandwiches or not which now seems like american people don't i think i'm assuming american people i don't know it seems like american people don't butter their sandwiches they prefer mayo or like other sort of spreads cream cheese even whereas it's like uh, most people i know in this country would butter their sandwiches are we archaic is there something wrong with us Please watch that video, let me know your thoughts. We do still have a monarchy, so I suppose that answers that question. Ah, uh, well.